Welcome back, everyone, to Vox Markets. My name is Paul Hill, and I'm delighted again to be able to speak to accomplished investor and ex-fund manager, Ian Staples. Um, so welcome, Ian. Hi, good morning. Uh, now we've had a ton of um, geopolitical news over the past week, um, and also we've uh, uh, started the US earnings season. But before we sort of dig into the details, I don't suppose you could quickly remind investors of what type of stocks you like. Yeah, I mean it's quite straightforward. I love, I love proper grown-up companies with sensible balance sheets and proper working capital. I like them to have a good brand and reputation. If they do innovation, I like them. I like them to be able to appropriate appropriate it and deliver a good return on it. I like companies that have got a good architecture, be that internally or good relationships with customers and suppliers. And I love companies that have got unique assets. So. British Airways, for example, not um, with its uh, landing slots at Heathrow. I always look for those sorts of those sorts of qualities in a company. Yeah, those sort of economic modes. And how has that sort of strategy panned out in the first sort of like three and a half months of the year so far? Well, it's done actually very, very nicely. Um, oh, well done. <laughs> I like to I like to own stocks um, rather than rather than rent them. Um, so a couple of my uh, consumer ones in terms of war paint and ultima products and um, they've done they've done very nicely and have been a long-term holder of lock and store um, oh. because of its excellent um operational track record but that had rather a rather a nice bid came in um for that a couple of weeks ago um so uh looking 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 very pretty at the moment so uh, yeah i think i've put the kibosh on it now <laughs> yeah, you'll get some nice, uh, nice proceeds in to redeploy. Now, yeah. just on that M and A theme, we've had a lot of questions over the last uh, couple of days from investors in terms of equals, which is a popular retail share. I just disclose, I own uh, shares, and I know you had a big chunk of it in your time. I mean, you built up a, a big stake, and you've unfortunately yeah. made, you, you, you've made your previous employer very rich from this uh, from yeah. this company. But in terms of the um, he came out with prelims last week, which were very strong. Um, I think they're on a run rate of cash generation of just about a one million a month now. So they're generating yeah. a lot of a lot of money. Um, but um, they've now they also disclosed the day after the, at the end of the um, towards the end of the put up on the shut up that they've got two interested parties. One of them's a private equity tech company, Madison Dearborn Partners, and the other one now yeah. is a trade buyer. Uh, rails and what's your sort of views and I, I don't want to put you on the stump here Ian but because you don't know but but what's the chances of a deal being done and if it if it is done underlying bold if it is done then what sort of price range would a a, a, a fund manager think this might be sensible well it's <clears throat> that's the eternal question isn't it I think the <laughs> fact you've got you've got two parties obviously the the board of equals is very keen to introduce some sort of uh, dynamic bidding tension um, to make sure that there is proper value realised. The share price hasn't got too excited about it, has it? I mean, the it hasn't sort of hasn't perked up in uh, spiked up in any in any sort of big way. In fact, also you've still got equal sitting on a PE round about fifteen times, suggests that the market hasn't yet. Um, got too excited, or there hasn't been any, certainly any num numbers banded around about what what sort of what sort of takeout level you might see. Um, so I think you know, sort of here we are at one twenty five, one thirty, one hundred and thirty p. You're going to be looking at sort of you would you would imagine anything north of one fifty, one sixty should should clinch it. Um, yeah. Do you think that's going to be enough though? Because uh... I know the I know the the house broker can accord have got a one seven five on it, and the when you look at the the outlook and the year to date trading, they're on a basically it looks just on a revenue run rate that even if they don't grow at all for the rest of the year, which is frankly incomprehensible because they've got that they've got that beachhead in Europe, they'd still hit their their targets in terms of re revenue. So it does yeah. look as though with this, there's a strong instance of upgrades. And you've got the um, you've got Fleet Corp also in the US. Their six month lockup uh, agreement is or standstill agreement is coming to a close. I think on the second of May. I think you know, I mean it's really, of course, dependent on the sort of sort of sort of levels that um, either the these two parties will 
will do will actually sort of put up with um versus what gets the interest of um interest of the shareholders um throughout i think um there's there's probably an argument that given the st strategic and operational excellence which equals has delivered you're going to see 150 160 as a lower bound and you could also perhaps argue that because in because of its purchase of unex mm. the belgian payments distributor in last summer uh, which is now integrated that allows equals to bring payments cards and multi-currency products to new customers across europe you're actually getting that thrown in for free yeah. um so whether or not you'll actually see them then pay up um, sort of the 192 pound level and um, would be would be in, would be certainly you know obviously very interesting and, and a, a very nice a very nice payday for shareholders yeah but i think the fact that you're seeing in the share seeing in the share price that the market is quite sort of not not skeptical but it hasn't certainly hasn't reacted in in any sort of not in a in a frenzied excited way to suggest mm. that people are going to pay up so I'd, I'd, if you, if you hold the shares, sit tight, okay, and, uh, and, and then wait and see would be my, uh, would be my advice. Well, I'm certainly taking your suggestion. I've, I've got, I've got a re it's my largest position, so I'm definitely holding and, and waiting to see what happens. Either way, okay. if they, if they don't, if they don't get a bid, then I think trading is so strong. And what's been really encouraging to me as a shareholder is that it's been going on for six months this obviously the strategic view yeah. and it hasn't disrupted the business seemingly at the top level and we've gone through a recession so just imagine what the business could do when it hasn't got that disruption and we start expanding yeah. in the uk <laughs> yeah i mean it's got i mean the the fact that it's got an excellent excellent simply simply superb um, technology in terms of its core building blocks you yeah. know these multi-currency i bands and bank rate connectivity and clearance mm. So it's just the sort of architecture I was talking about at the start of our chat. Yeah, you know, this is this is an ex excellent example of it, and it delivered as you point out a couple of days ago. It pointed out absolutely knockout numbers: revenues up thirty-seven percent, EBITDA up seventy mm. percent to twenty-one million pounds. Um, and also, as you point quite correctly point out, um, quite simply, superb cash generation. Um, so now, sit still and enjoy the ride on that one. Okay, well, let's switch gears. Let's go to another sector, into the sort of like the the van rental. We've got Ready Northgate, and uh, I haven't looked at this for some time. It's an eight hundred forty million market cap company. It's got a bit of debt, so seven hundred fifty million pounds. It's that probably includes leases, but it does trade at seven times PE, which yeah. has got a lot of bad news built in. It's just it's it's ludicrously ludicrously um, rated for the excellence. That Martin Ward and his team have introduced um, since they bought um, since they bought Northgate um, a couple of years ago. Ready was always a very well-run um, company, thanks to Martin Ward and his team. And um, now that they've got they've got Northgate, the fact that they've got this wonderful integrated service platform, which continu continues to deliver new contract wins with an increasingly large proportion of revenues underpinned by multi-year service contracts. You've got simply superb business. You've got cash generation, which is excellent, which means they can invest in developing the fleet assets and support expansion plans. They can ex open new sites um, thanks to this cash generation. And they've got wonderfully stable margins mm. for both vehicle rental and accident claims in the repair business. They've pumped up the dividend by 11% to 8.3p. They've got a 30 million share buyback program running since august it's just the wrong price mm. no i would agree i mean with six and a half percent dividend yield seven seven pe as as i mentioned and um we're doing that stop, stop buyback <sighs> no, it's just wrong. what's going to be the, what's going to be the catalyst to change it is it going to get private equity just bidding for this because it looks like the perfect vehicle for them asset backed you can leverage it up cash generation stable margins 10 percent plus ebit well it would be another simply superb uk um uk pro <laughs> uk company that gets that gets taken out i would imagine by us private equity it's it's just the wrong a single single digit pe with a you know a six seven percent dividend yield it's just yeah. it's just wrong yeah you know, yeah. The, you know the, the rocky 
performance, you know, return on capital, it's it's rock solid, absolutely wonderful capital allocation policy in terms of the operational parts of the business. Mm. And they just continue to go from strength to strength with insurers. Yeah. It's it's I just don't understand why, you know, it shouldn't be eight hundred and fifty million, it should be one and a half billion. Yeah, no, I would agree. Certainly in in better time. It just shows you how hated I think the UK market is uh, yeah. on an international uh, perspective. If just to remind anybody, if you've got any questions, slot put them into the um into the chat box and I'll um, ask Ian or, or, or myself uh, th- those ones or read them out. Okay, let's stay on the um, the industrial theme. A bit smaller this one. In fact, rather than sort of like 850 million, and we're talking 13 million, let's go to Techmar Group, which I know was a previous sort of minnow share held in, in your portfolio. And I, yeah. I, the reason why I raise it and as a highlight it to investors, I don't own it. But it basically does oil fill services um, largely offshore for increasingly wind, but also for obviously you know big heritages in oil and gas. And I think it it does a geopolitic geopolitical geotechnical engineering consultancy um, for sort of like laying subsea cables and marine. So not just the consultancy, it also does the the physical putting sleepers and um, foundations in. Um, but also does the increasing the interconnects and stuff like this. And this one has just gone through a real big transition. It's got a big strategic investor who's come on, SCF Partners, who have put a loan facility, which they haven't drawn down yet. It's convertible, I think. Well, it is convertible. I don't know what your views on this one, because it has been, it's been really tough sledging for investors. But my instinct with a tailwind of North Sea oil and gas exploration, geopolitical tensions in terms of having to protect, you know, basically a sub subsea cables and the instruments of offshore wind says to, and they've got improving margins, gross margins, says to me there's something stirring here for people who like, you know, more speculative small cap companies. Yeah, I think, um, I think uh, speculative is a is an appropriate adjective. <laughs> Yeah. Um, um I think <laughs> very polite. I think um to be to be brutally fair, it's it's been in the wars tech market. It floated sort of I think five or six years ago on AIM. And as you as you quite rightly point out, it, it enjoyed its time in the sun in the sun, thanks to its specialization, certainly um with interconnectors. And there's a lot of lot of excitement around it, quite frankly, because of the um, the wind, offshore wind, and the maintenance required um, for those those pieces of kit. Unfortunately, there was a bit of quite a, some stern competition, and also some, I think, shall we say, commercial naivety under the previous management team, which meant that when conditions worsened in in just sort of the construction of these offshore uh, wind fields, Tetmar had little to no protection, so it struggled, and also there's, there's some stern competition. Um, meant that Techmar really, quite to use a technical term, got absolutely clobbered. Mm. And uh, the new management team came in, Alistair MacDonald, uh, industry veteran, highly respected, very strong operator, but you can't go around changing contracts that have been written on, under under a new, under an old, under the old management team, no matter how good you are. Um, so he set about a on a on a painful uh, journey. Re, redrafting these contracts as and when it was legally possible to do so. Um, but in the meantime, of course, the share price tanked. I think the actual offering of what they've got is pretty, <clears throat> is very strong. And in the partner of FCF, part, and of FCF partners, a very sensible, very strong, very successful um, fossil fuel, natural gas, um, energy expert that wants to use Tecmar as a platform over the next three to five years to actually build a, a much larger business than it is today, hence the convertible loan note. Um, so if you're on, if you're interested in a ride like that and you want to participate in the upside as the world as the world changes in terms of energy generation, then um, Tatmar is certainly a, a very interesting place to be. Yeah. And what was quite encouraging, I thought, from an operational perspective, was that when they put the the recent numbers out, they had a sort of like a 
I can't remember exactly. I think it was a twenty million pound order book. Because they did they do forty million of sales roughly, but they had a, a reasonably sized and growing order book. But what was really encouraging was that they gave us an indication of what the gross margin was, and they broke even last year the gross margin, which is about twenty three percent. Their order book was twenty five was twenty eight percent, another five percent higher. And if they broke even last year at twenty three, and their order book forward order book, which would hopefully monetized this year was at 28 percent then they there should be a following wind that actually their, their pricing is firming and their margins are going up and that's that that is the operational footprint that i'm hoping alistair can bring to that business the discipline yeah <clears throat> my point exactly i think mm. the commercial naivety has been thoroughly erased and uh mr mcdonald is uh and the the velvet the velvet glove with a steel fist, which is what the company needed. Good. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, let's jump up to the um, another up, up, in, in say industrials or, or, or rentals, but jump up the market cap. Let's go to uh, Keller, which is yeah. basically a global geotechnical piling uh, business. And I think I know when we did last year, you mentioned about infrastructure. Not last year, last with last time we spoke a couple of months back, you mentioned about infrastructure out in the states with Hill and Smith. I think yeah, was a, that's right. Yeah. There's yeah. another one. Now this this has had the same effect, doesn't it? It's got a, yeah. got a rocket booster up it with, yeah. uh, because of all this infrastructure. Give us your latest thoughts on Keller because well, it's, it's done very well. Yeah, it um, again, this is this is still the wrong price, even though it's doing, even though the company itself is doing very well. Um, it's delivered, as you quite rightly point out, a stunning performance um, and improvement across the business, and really. This is all down to the the changes um, that Michael Speakman, um, the the current CEO, has introduced um, since since he started in that role a few years ago. It was always a very accomplished, technically aware business, um, but I always I always got quite frustrated with it because there's always this sort of tendency. Mm. And to be a bit perhaps flabby on pricing, or there was a quite a seemingly quite a sort of a, a lazy layer of management that mm. sort of was very good at it, very good at delivering the job, but wasn't too bothered about um, growth and growth and delivery and good old fashioned things like sales, profits, cash flow. And it always struck me that somewhere deep down within the organization, there was a sort of a kernel of this is all very comfortable. Why change it? And a couple of CEOs prior to um, Michael coming on board can never quite smash this kernel of of comfort, and um, it led to some you know sort of quite frustrating or cross conversations. And thankfully, Michael Speakman came in and just didn't tolerate it. Um, so, as you'd expect from an excellent operator like he is. He flew around the world, figured out what was what, um, kept his thoughts to himself or certainly didn't tell shareholders like us, but then actually went through each part of the business like a dose of salts and got rid of this kind of kernel of complacency and said, well, OK, you're either with me or against me. These are the changes I'm going to put through. And he, he initiated a very significant cultural change which has now been seen in the numbers. So for example, the I think the numbers, the revenues were just up 1%, but big deal, but because the operating margin went up 240 bips to 6.1%. Now that's yeah. still, okay, you know, quite a low number for operating margin, but that kind of delivery just suggests, you know, just how big and how nutty that mm -hmm. kernel of um, complacency was. So, you know, that meant that oper underlying operating profit went up 67% to 181 million and net debt fell by a third to 146. Rocky, the highest it's been for 15 years, at 23%. So funny enough, they put the dividend up 20%. <laughs> so, you know, sort of this continued discipline pricing in the US, where admittedly training is very strong and the government's got its checkbook out, but okay, you make hay while the sun shines. And it's trimming the portfolio via rationalization. So if you can't deliver a decent return on the capital invested, you either fix it, and Mr. Speakman, no doubt, will have a P&L and a balance sheet for all his business units. Or if you can't fix it, then we'll sell you or close you down. Um, so, you know, that kind of concentrates minds. And 
on top of it all, they've got a robust order book of one and a half billion pounds. And yeah. this company is undergoing a very exciting and very strong transformation. Um, thanks to thanks to Michael. Um, if he was here, he'd be blushing red because he's a very modest, charming man. But uh, he's doing an absolutely phenomenal job. Good on him and his team. You raise a really good point. I mean, uh, first on valuation, yeah, seven and a half times PE. Wrong. It's just, it's it's just crazy, crazily cheap. But you raise a really good point. There's a lot of UK, probably a lot of companies worldwide, which frankly could do a lot, lot better. And where you get sort of like, you know, shareholders or a, a really dynamic, CEO, you can you know you can make a lot of change in terms of change you know altering the uh, the culture to become yeah. more you know sort of like profitable and that's as you say being disciplined in terms of pricing where you have your barriers you know to, to entry mm -hmm. to, you know, your, your economic moat but also just stopping doing stuff you shouldn't be doing where there's no competitive advantage. No, I mean I think Keller had something in Kazakhstan which okay great you know they they need. Mm. things dug they need buildings constructed or mm. you know, lakes reclaimed or or whatever but if you're not earning a turn and you can't take the cash out then why in the dickens are you in Kazakhstan yeah. you know yeah. it might be it might be a bit of fun you can boast to your mates at the golf club at the weekend that you spent the last three weeks in the desert <laughs> um and but if you're not earning a earning a return for your shareholders then, uh, then why why are you bothering yeah Okay, well, let's move, um, switch gears again to another sector, but equally has gone through a, a huge transformation. We've got CMC Markets, which is one of yeah. the leading UK CFD providers and um, old spread betters. But I think it's also adding on a number of other products like SIPs and equity trading and all the traditional stuff that maybe even things like Hargreaves Lansdowne do and stuff like this. This one is just well, I mean, you know, it's doubled, hasn't it, in the last sort of yeah. six months? So let me put the chart up. But uh, what's your sort of latest on this one? How far has it got to run? Because uh, it certainly has just been like a rocket ship this year. I know a lot of people have made very good money out of it. I think this has got, <clears throat> excuse me, I think this has got much further to go. Mm. Um, Peter Crudas, yeah. very, very successful entrepreneur. I think he owns still, what, 59% of the Yes, that's shares. right. And um, they floated some time ago now, I think six, seven years or even longer. And um, for a long time, um, the market treated it pretty much as a CFD player. You know, what, what's the difference between it and IG index? And um, a few years ago, they undertook a significant investment program to develop a platform for long-term savings, um, which meant that they, as you can see, um, you know, the share price trundled around 100p, 120p mm. on the chart you've just put up for, for quite some time, which led to which led to some frustration, understandably, um, because they could either stay the same but deliver upgrades or they could invest money in the full glare of the market and um, deliver later. Now, what, um, what they've come to realise is that <clears throat> at the start of 2024, they said, right, we're going to continue investing in these programs, but we're also going to go and implement a significant cost-cutting and efficiency plan, which saw the share price um, spark up up to about £1.40 there on about the start of 2024 that you've got on your chart. Yeah. And then there was a trading update just before Easter um, where net operating um, income um, was going to be at the – top end of expectations, institutional and B2B business uh, trading strongly and development upgrades along platforms have continued. So there's an awful lot here, an awful lot to like. Um, there's awful, there's an awful lot more than just CFD. That's just, that's just plain wrong. Mm. You've got this, <clears throat> this wonderful investment that they've been making, or deep, expensive investment they've been making over the past few years, beginning to bear fruit. I think this one can run and run and run. Mm. And what sort of like margins do you think it'll sort of like sort of get to steady state? It's currently projected to do about 18% EBIT margins, which for a financial services platform to consumers actually is not, I mean, it's, it's good for most normal businesses, but actually is, is still cheap compared to say Hargreaves Lansdowne, which is about 40, 50%. Yeah, I think they, they've obviously, they're going to be careful. 
and they don't want to um, sort of upset people or sort of promise too much. But I think mm -hmm. that that eighteen percent will be a ultimately proved to be a, a lower bound. Yeah, I certainly think once you get sort of the you know the network effect of any half decent platform, I think eighteen percent is a is a conservative target. Yeah. Okay, we got a question just overnight in terms of Hargreaves Lansdowne, um, which is obviously a big business in, in a similar sort of area. It doesn't do CFDs and spread betting, but it's the UK's number one sort of like financial services platform. And um, its competitor, one of its big sort of like challenger competitors, AJ Bell, came out with some pretty impressive numbers. And the sort of like, the, I guess that the, the thesis is, yes, it's been impacted, both of them have, by the consumer uh, duty legislation, which the FCA has implemented and treating your customers fairly and all this sort of stuff. But the shares currently trade at roughly around about just under 12 times PE. And AJ Bell trades at about 16 times, e, you know, um, uh, PE. And, they, and they're essentially pretty much the similar sort of businesses. And with our Hargreaves Lansdowne, it's got more customers, it's in bigger. So it just is, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on, on this one at all. It, it, again, it looks, it looks cheap, but the, obviously the margins have been coming under pressure because of the consumer duty. Yeah, I think, I think the the potential for things to be for it to be squeezed, you know, sort of the the FCA perhaps doesn't always enjoy the best of reputations for sort of insightful or uh, <laughs> regulation which delivers the outcome which it claims it's going to deliver. You know, just look at Mifid. Yeah. So, I certainly think that. It will take some time for the likes of Hargreaves, Lansdowne, the AJ Bells to adapt. But of course, they don't. These these sorts of businesses don't become so successful as they do just by sitting still and letting things happen. I'm sure they'll take a very vigorous, and proactive, and constructive approach to dealing mm. with the regulation. I'm sure they'll invest properly, or they have invested properly in the systems and in their compliance um, to ensure they're as efficient as pos efficiency as possible. And to deal with these new these new regulations, I think you know the the actual sort of levels of cost um, that these these platform providers sometimes sometimes charge. I think that that's the angle that CMC is seeing mm. in terms of the level of charging. I mean, look at the debate around St James's Place last month. Yeah, that, that's different. That is that's that, yeah, that, that, that got abusive. That did with exit yeah. fees, but it just sort of reflects, you know, sort of the. I'm certainly not saying that Hargreaves Lansdowne or AJ Bell have any kind of kind of abusive charging or anything like that. Yeah. But there's just this feeling that perhaps, you know, sometimes the charges are, are too high of what actually the customer is actually paying for, and I think this is the angle that CMC is paying. Mm. saying we're going to use the best in technology to deliver a platform which will allow people to for long long term savings products at a at a at a lower at a lower charging charging level i think that the sort of returns that you see or margins that you see at Hargreaves Lansdowne AJ Bell points to one to the strength of the platform but inevitably those levels of returns attract competition e.g. cmc and those Unless you're very, very good, you're going to see some of those margins um, um, eroded um, by competitive and or uh, regulatory pressure. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you made your money in Hargreaves Lansdowne, well done. Very good. Um, might be time to uh, play elsewhere. Yeah. And just, I mean, who do you use for your sort of like, you know, share dealing? I mean, I use both AJ Bell and Hargreaves Lansdowne because I find them the best two platforms in terms of giving me what I want for self because there's more and more people are doing to self-invest, whether that's they invest in individual stocks or whether they invest in funds, but they're, they're, they're doing more themselves because they realise they want to have greater influence and greater accountability. Well, who do you use? Which platform? I like AJ Bell. I just like, just like the software. Yeah. Yeah. And it, I mean, I'm mostly, they're both, very, they're both good, both cheap. I, I would say, I'd probably say AJ Bell is 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 better than um that than, than as a consumer anyway than uh, than Hargreaves Lansdowne. Yeah. Okay, let's move to uh, another one. We've got Spectra Systems, which I think does special sort of software and materials technology to help central banks in terms of stopping counterfeit 
currencies and you've got other sort of counterfeits and stuff in this area that people trying to you know knock n- knock things off etc so what's your sort of your latest on this one because uh <laughs> It's traded about 18 times PE. Yeah, this one, this one is, um, is I think, a simply superb um, company. Mm. It's run by, excuse me, a professor of physics, uh, Nabil Lewandi. And um, it basically um, sale, sells covert materials in physical authentication um, and also sensors. So, all the different protections when on the five or ten pound note or any sort of sort of paper currency anywhere in the world. Now you when we when we were growing up, the, do you remember the one pound note? You're lucky enough to yes. Look up, yes, you do, yeah. <laughs> that was you a lot remember? of money in my day. Yeah, yeah, you get about five five Mars bars for a pound, couldn't you? Uh, you no, get the, twenty the, yeah, yeah, twenty bags of Walker's crisps. <laughs> <laughs> the um you know, you used to get the, the watermark of the queen, I and mean, yes. they used to get the silver bar. Yes. Um, going down, you know, that was that was sort of the anti-fraud. Now there's sort of about 15 or 20 different um sort of attributes on a note um, which have been developed, um, or which Spectra Systems has said we we can do this in terms of optical materials and also the, the sensors um required to pick it up. So it's something that's very, very clever, almost impossible to replicate. One, because one, it's very clever, but secondly, it's also illegal Mm. um, because you're dealing with central banks and funnily enough, governments and central banks take their currency rather seriously. Um, So you've got some, Spectre's got some great relationships with various central banks, including the Bank of England. And um, before Christmas last year, about 23rd of December, um, Spectre acquired Carter Security Printers, which brought many more opportunities and provided Spectre with a secure supply on a par with um, two largest banknote polymer substrate suppliers, one of whom, of course, is, is De La Rue. Mm. Now, with Carter, Spectre's been working on supplying ready-to-print bespoke polymer product to central banks it's developing strong links with a Middle Eastern bank over the course um, of last year and doubtless has been working on it this year. And it's got net cash of eight million dollars. Um, so it's it's just simply superb and uh, very well run. And uh, the bill's a very clever man and driven man. So, mm. yeah. And what's, like what's, what's the sort of the, the secular growth drivers? Because if you assume that uh, physical currency I mean, I'll just to give you an example, my daughters never carry any cash around with them at all. It's, e- it's either the mobile app, it's either, you know, equals, yeah. F- equal, equals FX or equals or or, yeah. or 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 basically credit cards. And they just don't, they just pay digitally rather than actually playing with cash. No, it's, <clears throat> and certainly um, the, the sort of the use of cash, you know, sort of on a sort of a, you know, like an example basis, you think, oh, it's not going to exist. But actually, the uses of cash is still about 90% of transactions. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> is, that through, is that through the organised cr- crime scene, is it? Yeah, no, no, around <laughs> the world. That's, that's for your, your, your cocaine fix at the weekend yeah, or something. no, no, it's around, you know, sort of 80%, 90% of transactions still all cash um, on, a, on a global basis. On so a that's global, why, okay, yeah. So I, I I think you're quite right to point out that on a you know, sort of you know my 16 year old daughter I you know I joke when I give her a five is do you know do you know how to use this stuff? <laughs> so it sounds like your teenage daughter's the same. Yeah, yeah, they um, don't. I mean, they don't don't carry any around at all. No, um, but no, I still still the use. You know, it's all too easy to look at. Yeah, look at that and then extrapolate. But actually, the use of cash is um, is still still very. Uh, People still like what's actually happened during the um, cost pressures, mm. certainly in the UK. People are using cash because it's very effective for budgeting purposes. You know, if you can only afford £100 a week to spend, you take your £100 out of the ATM mm. and that's it. Mm. <laughs> you know, when you've got £100 worth of notes in your hand, it's very easy to budget. Whereas if you're flashing your mobile phone or your 
your plastic over the it's not real money is it it doesn't really feel like you're you're spending so i think people are finding certainly in uh perhaps not the uk but it's sort of you know sort of in the middle east where it's actually far more prevalent in terms of in terms of cash yeah Okay, good. Okay, well, let's move on to another um, sort of like more uh, sort of homeland security area. We've got big technologies, which does uh, uh, prisoner uh, tagging systems. And the reason why I raise yeah. this is because it listed about two or three years ago, absolute darling. It's got inc- margins you could kill for. I think uh, I was just looking at uh, roughly about 46% EBIT margins, 70% gross margins. And it does these, as I say, electronic tagging and software devices that help uh, prison systems to um, to allow um, p- uh, prisoners to go to, to be at home, basically, rather than actually being you know incarcerated, etc. It's got a new product coming out also, which does monitoring um, of um, alcohol for prisoners if they've been given a, a you know an order that they can't actually drink and stuff like this, and they lost they, they lost basically a contract out in Colombia, which hit the shares. But they've they've come back since then. I was just wondering whether you've got any thoughts on this one because it seems to be an extremely high quality, long recurring revenue business that makes very good margins. And um, it was just really just in terms of you know it's still some way to go you know to go back to its all time highs. I know you were a shareholder some time yeah. ago, but I'd, uh, I'll just be sort of quite interested to pick your brains on what you think about this one. Definitely a quality stock. Yes, definitely. It's definitely a quality stock. Um, margins, the margins tell you that. I think the the weakness in the share price is an is an opportunity because I think this sort of this sort of company, one, is very tightly run. Sarah Murray, mm. very impressive individual, and very driven. Um, certainly would not have. Uh, expensive cost base or and, and she's always shown um, ability to think very quickly and flexibly and to see challenges as opportunities i think the fact that because you're dealing with often quite conservative institutions in terms of the the prison service in in various countries that you can't always get sort of a, a smooth progression in earnings, which the market loves. Also, the contracts can be quite lumpy, um, which is another thing the market the market dislikes. I think also um, the fact that they're difficult to predict means that some people don't like it. I think it's it's crucial um, with a with a company like big technologies to take a to take a three to five year view. And I think you'll be very wealthy if you in, if you took a started a position now, mm. you'll do very very well over the next over the next three years, primarily because I think it's the one the excellence of technology. Secondly, they've opened a new office in Latin America and they've expanded developments in the U.S., which has got the largest, not only the largest prison population in the world, but also one of the highest incarceration rates in the in the world um so whilst that they that's their that's that's their decision but it's also a very expensive decision um, to incarcerate somebody the fact also you've got continuing product development both in software and in the hardware um the fact that they've got this this alco tag is is very interesting um it it works um by um when when we all when we all enjoy a tipple i'm not saying i'm, I'm no, not I, saying i'm, I'm looking not, forward to it yeah i'm not i'm not saying um it's sort of the sort of tipple that involves you know abusive levels of consumption of alcohol but Speak even if for you yourself have, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> well well no, I, I think the sort of you know so i'm not saying half a bottle of half a bottle of scotch consumption but <laughs> even if you have even if you have a couple of glasses of wine of an evening with your dinner or after dinner everybody's body and uh, we we some of the ethanol which is the fun which is the fun bit um which makes us go a bit giddy um our bodies can't always deal with it the liver so we basically sweat it out it comes out in our effluvia 
And that can be detected using um, the old breathalyzer technology. Do you remember um, yeah, the breathalyzer do. bags from the Sweeney? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they used to go green, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's exactly exactly the same thing, but in a little, just in a little pouch on the on the kit. And so the alcohol reacts with a with a harmless um, chemical um, within the pouch. That changes that changes the electrical um, res re electrical properties, and therefore you're drinking alcohol. So if someone's got a problem with alcohol. You know, let's say something horrible like um, he gets drunk, beats up his girlfriend, and therefore, quite rightly, he's in the neck. Mm. Um, but he's done his six months or his year. Um, but part of his parole is one: you don't go within five miles of your girlfriend, and you you don't touch hooch um, at all. Yeah, you know that's okay. You know, sort of his his a here's an individual with a problem, um, but he's if he's out about. Let's, let's, let's at least keep his keep him away from his girlfriend and keep him away from the source. Otherwise, you're back inside. Yeah. So it saves money for the state and you know, hopefully pushes the individual to uh, mend his uh, mend his ways. Mm. No, so you, you brought sort of like some some lovely memories actually. We used to have some drinking games, which was uh, what shade of green could you turn the uh, breathalyzer <laughs> down the pub? <laughs> it's crazy, isn't it? But hey, it, it tickled my it tickled my interest. I'm sure you walked there. Yeah, <laughs> I, did, I didn't manage to walk back. Okay, let's, let's stay on the defence area. We've got uh, Babcock International, which got absolutely pummeled a few years ago. It's just sort of like it's a large defense contractor, helps build ships, I think, uh, around the country, but also does lots of other stuff for the armed forces and military. And the shares again have just have been on a bit of a tear, haven't they? I don't know what yeah. your latest view on this one is. Well, this one is um, is particularly interesting, mm. um, not, not just because you know, you've, unfortunately, we've got something of a something of a tailwind in that the world is now an in increasingly unsafe place um so the the work that babcock and others do are absolutely central to defense of not just the united kingdom but pretty much um anyone that likes to go about their business without worrying about being bombed mm. um david lockwood um the current ceo um ex chief executive of laird and a, and a few other companies um came in a couple of years ago and really set about clearing out sort of the uh, what was what was a mess um the it was rather prone um to delays profit warnings prior to his arrival and he really just went in and went through it in a dose of salts and said right this isn't basically this isn't good enough we need a huge cultural change let's think about one how we do our contracts let's discuss with the mod the light rail of price versus risk and let's understand how we're actually going to run this business properly and deliver to some rather important customers. Cause this sort of business I like in terms of the sort of the architecture, you know, the set of relationships it's got with the MOD, for example, it's got a recent announcement about the refit and maintenance life extension for HMS Victorious, one of the UK's Vanguard submarines. And it's heavily involved in, in dreadnought. You just, you just can't sort of replicate that that sort of level of technical operational excellence if you can't deliver when you've got sort of stuff like that landing in your lap which babcock wasn't and then something's seriously wrong so i think lockwood's gone in highly highly non-trivial task changing and improving the culture across the organization to deliver and hit targets and it's done an awful lot of hard slog um, to fix and to make sure that this is a business that that can that can deliver. So you can see that lovely, beautiful, yeah. that lovely bit in 2023, around about July 2023. Mm. You know, people started, to, markets started to realise. Oh, hang on a minute, here is something. There's something going on here. You know, this is this is this is a different organization that's that's emerging from what has been rather a an, an unfortunate and very unpleasant um mm. period of um of, of weak delivery 
and it's got now such a clear capital allocation potency, it's actually um, recently reinstated the dividend following a four-year hiatus. Now, it's continuing to concentrate on improving operational delivery across the marine, the nuclear, the land, and aviation. And you know, it's sort of the events of the past week, you know, the events of last night just, just highlight just how important it is to have a robust um, defence um, business or mm. set of businesses. I'm a back of course, is not the only defence, but you've got British Air, Respect, or what's it called now? BAE Systems. Yeah. Um, de- delivering um, very important work um, for UK and others. So the results <clears throat> later on in June, July, I expect them to be expect them to be very strong. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, it's a sound so it's a, it's a similar sort of self help uh, story as Keller, isn't it? You've had a yes, you know, you've had a business that could, had a lot of potential, and now it's got secular tailwinds. It's got a dynamic CEO who's shaking up the culture and delivering on the bottom yeah. line and, re- and returns. And uh, you see that coming. I, I hope it happens more and more, actually, in terms of you know businesses that have so much potential. Yes, and I I think also I think the you know the horrific events that we've seen. In Israel, no matter what your political opinions are, I think it's you know sort of shows that no matter how distasteful some people find um, making submarines, building nuclear reactors, it's absolutely crucial for the yeah. for the defence of the defence of the realm, as, yeah, you, no, as right. you might as you might say. And it's you know when when you've got companies that, that have gone through you know a self help period. You know, Babcock is going to you know really, really play a very important role. But it's still, you know, it's you know it's still only on twelve times PE. You know, yeah. something like that. Mm. You know, it's, it's just you know sort of that kind of manufacturing excellence that Lockwood has has um, encouraged or initiated. It just deserves such a higher rating than that. So <clears throat> stick with Babcock. Yeah, no, I'd agree. Okay, another one which is um, looks looks very cheap is um, Illico, Build Tech Software. The reason I mention it, it did a quick sort of like um, small bolt-on acquisition of a little company out in um, uh, Eastern Europe. I think it's Romania, a Vertical Digital. And the idea of, of bolting this one, this, it, Illico is a software business, but it needs assistance in terms of implementing it with its customers and doing consultancy and, and moving into Eastern Europe, maybe even longer term when the, the rebuild of um, if Ukraine happens and they do get, hopefully get a ceasefire. They trade at roughly around about 2.2 times sales, which for a software business is extremely cheap. Um, and they're moving, uh, obviously, to a SaaS transition from a sort of perpetual license model. I think about three quarters of their revenues now are recurring, um, which gives them not good visibility and stuff like that. Got their results on Tuesday. I'll just want any any quick sort of thoughts at all about the business? Is it just I don't know, work just carry on doing what they're doing. Yeah, I think so because these um, when uh, when companies go through the. Uh... The, this transition to SaaS from perpetual license, often there's a hiatus in share price performance in either direction as the market takes a, you know, takes a bit of a, a deep breath to say, mm. <laughs> you know, is there, is there something else going on here? I, I'm sure there isn't with the lead card, um, but you know, it always takes, there's always a bit of skepticism floating around mm. despite the excellence. I mean, the share price is, you know, sort of it's perked up from lows of 65p. It's round yeah. just shy of a pound now. Um, so you, know, you can't you can't complain if you got your timing right there. Um, but I think there's there is, you're quite right, there is an awful lot more to go for if they can get this this distribution right. Mm. And I think what they do, obviously, <laughs> there's a great demand for it, but you're not really going to see. Um, any you're not going to see a great re-rating until the the SaaS transition is complete. Yeah, well, I think it's I think they've definitely reached an inflection point because they indicate that revenues are going up, having been you know gone down for the last two years by adjusting from that uh, that SaaS. But you're right, it's let's let's see how they get on. Okay, let's switch gears to um, another sector, 
consumer. We've got, uh, let's go down the bowling alleys. We've got Hollywood Bowl, which I think is the UK's largest bowling alley. And it, not only in the UK, but it's also branching out into uh, Canada as well. Yeah. What's your sort of your, your latest on this one? Because uh, I guess you probably quite like hitting the skittles, don't you? That, which is sort of like t- t- trying the product out. It's very gratifying. Very yes. gratifying. Um, no, I, 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 um, I really like this business. It is, it is really, really well run. Mm. Um, Stephen Burns, the CEO, has done yeah. a fantastic job. Uh, Lawrence Keane, the CFO, he's now in. He's, he went off to Canada, and um, to lead the expansion there. Also, um, very strong operator, or strong operators both. I, the reason that, the reason I'd, I'd like this is because one. Um, you know, sort of hits, you know, net cash, um, 41 million pounds. Um, but they've really sort of changed the experience of 10 pin bowling. Mm. You know, unfortunately, I'm old enough to remember when you when you walked into these places 30 years ago, you know, the carpet wasn't always great. Your feet stuck to the ground. <laughs> there was a sort of a strange smell of fried food, yeah. um, you know, chips. And sometimes, you know, you saw chips, really in places where you shouldn't see chips. Yeah. And the bar wasn't very nice and you didn't really always feel particularly, you know, sort of safe at certain times on a Friday night. Yeah. Do I want to be here? Why am I spending money here? Yeah. And that was 30 years ago. Um, And they've done an amazing job in terms of changing that perception in terms of one, it's actually a nice place to go pretty much any time of the day. They've done a fantastic job in terms of filling up the the shoulders. You know, you've got the if you look think of a you know sort of it gets busy around about eight o'clock, but the shoulder times you might say are four or five o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. You know, sort of they've understood their customers and um, so they can get kids in during the school holidays at those times. Um, so, you know, if mum and dad, if mum or dad is at work, the other one can take the children to Hollywood Bowl, have, you know, a couple of hours fun for 10, 20 quid, maybe a bit, of, maybe a burger and chips if they if they behave themselves. And it's actually a very pleasant experience. Also, an extremely, we work extremely hard to keep, keep it clean, uh, make it bright and welcoming to to everyone, not just someone who wants, you know, hit the, you know, go with these six mates, have six pints and then smash some stuff around, you know, okay. You know, I'm sure that happens, but you can't make a business out of that. Yeah. Um, and Hollywood Bowl has done an amazing job mm. in making it very welcoming and very open to everybody. Also, they've done a wonderful job on refurbishments. They've got the rollouts of pins on strings. Um, they're going green, the solar panel installations. Um, they're making it even easier um, to reserve your spot so you're not queuing, you're not sort of mucking around. So they've got a development of a new reservation system. Um, remains focused on high quality, so your feet don't stick to the floor. It's actually much nicer than that. And great value for money. So broad appeal to all customer groups. They're doing, continue to refurbish their UK estate. Um, they've got one new centre opened in the UK, two in Canada. It's got 71 centres in, only got 71 centres in the UK, and I think 11 in Canada. They're very, very careful about how they site um, their centres. I think they have a, um, they look at how many, um, they used to say chimney pots, but how many how many houses are within a 15 or 20 minute drive? Yeah. Uh, sort of how easy are they, is it to access? And, you know, Funnily enough, the the revenues and the, the business continues to go from strength to strength. You're on a P of 15 times, mm. divvy yield of just shy of 4%. What's not to like? This is buy, hold, forget. It's just brilliant. Yeah, yeah just- and, and also one of their competitors got taken out by private equity, didn't they? I think yeah. 10 Entertainment got bid yeah. at eight times EBITDA and yeah. Hollywood are about 6.3. So there's some catch yeah. up there. Okay, another one which is a bit of a fallen angel, actually. 
in the consumer space, we've got mid which group does sort of professional audio and visual equipment distributor around the world, etc. And it had its day, obviously, when we're all locked down because people around the world wanted to create music and do video and this sort of stuff. But the shares have, have come off and they've just perked up again just recently. What's your sort of what's the what's the investment thesis on this one? Well, I think um, one of the most important things um, uh, with any sort of stock is what's the what's the CEO like or what's the founder like. And then mm. um, you've got founder and CEO, Mr. Fenby, still in there. Yeah. I having, having floated the business eight, nine years ago. And um, he just he just loves the global specialist audio visual market. Mm. And he, he just eats, breathes, drinks it. And I think the fact that you've got um him still leading um, and realizing what where the market is going in terms of demand. And sort of being able to say, right, okay, very often you get not so much lifestyle businesses, but people that set up small businesses in in one geography with a particular specialization in a a very niche market, very technical market. What Stephen is simply superb at is recognizing, one, the technical excellence of the guys. And secondly, is it the kind of the right kind of culture? He goes along to them and says, well, you're very good in canada or you're you're very good in spain um but you don't seem to have much success in selling everywhere else in the world but everyone else loves that kind of product i've got a wonderful distribution network right why don't you come on and join in and you can keep your niche you can keep your um sort of your quirkiness that makes you special we will of course have financial controls and all that kind of stuff but come and join a much larger party and you you know we can complement one another the fact also that um the you know you've got this so many different niches that he can say right okay let's go into the canadian professional audio market through acquisition rather than spending shareholders money trying to develop it himself that'd be crazy mm. he just sees these niches now you do of course have macroeconomic pressures and higher interest rates um, sort of affecting everyone and um, money's more expensive people aren't perhaps spending or retailers or, or whoever sports ground aren't spending the same amount of money but he's still managed to d- deliver excellent numbers despite these pressures and taking advantage also um, to expand capabilities and knowledge via acquisition because other co- other smaller companies will be struggling. Mm. And here you are with a company that's sitting on a net debt to be a bit dar of just sort of over one point over one times. So even in a even in tough times, Medwich has really, really delivered. I mean, for example, revenue growth of seven percent, gross margin up 150 bips to 16.8%, stronger thanks to stronger technical product sales. Here, this is a this is a Rolls, this is a Rolls Royce of a company mm. um, that people think a a Robin Reliant with Del Boy in it. And it's just so (laughs) much, so much better. With a founder, with a founder led business, is there, what's the sort of optionality in terms of getting a takeover and and getting a bid? Because you tend to, from my experience, you tend to find unless they're sort of 65, 70, they don't particularly would never want to sell because they just love the business, which is great, but it just takes that, that optionality off the table. Well, I think it's, um, it's a bit like that line in the um, in the Italian job, isn't it? Where um, Camp Freddy says to Mr. Bridger, he might not be bent, Mr. Bridger. And then Mr. Bridger <laughs> comes back, everybody's bent, um, Camp <laughs> Freddy. I'm certainly not saying that the CEO or any CEO is bent, but the, if the price is high enough, anyone yeah, okay. and everyone will always take take that takeout. Um, I think Stephen Fenby will probably be a, a very hard negotiator mm. and he just wouldn't. Um, fall over and also I don't and also you're quite right I think he just loves the business yeah I think the um when the company floated I think the finance director had been with them for some time so he uh, he uh, had a uh, a wealth moment at the time of IPO I think he had was in the public markets for about 12 months and then he retired about age 42 or something okay but you know that's that's his choice I think Stephen will just go on and on and on unless yeah. there's a very large a very large check gets uh, wafted in front of his face. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, let's just switch to the final sector. We've got um, 
uh, Alpha Financial Man uh, Market Consulting, which is a consultant to the financial services sector. Um, mm -hmm. And I know a lot of people have uh, talked about this on the um, <clears throat> on the chat rooms and stuff. What what's sort of the investment cases behind this? Because obviously there's a lot of regulation going into the financial service sector. We mentioned the consumer duty, but also into pensions and all kinds of stuff. And it seems to be changing like the wind. So I guess that they're probably always getting somebody knocking on their door asking for advice. Yeah, I think <laughs> I think that's the that's the business case for you know sort of why it needs to exist yeah. and why it's done well when it's to be able to develop. You can see it had a it had a significant stumble in the summer of last year when it warned that lengthening sales cycles would slow down growth with supply and demand dynamics continuing to rebalance. And it's been rather disappointing ever, ever since. But I think the fact that one, it continues to see uh, robust client demand. Secondly, it's got a strong reputation amongst its blue chip client base, meaning that trading has improved through the, the final quarter of the financial year to March 2024. And this is this is a company with a with a you know this architecture, this set of relationships and reputation that I talked about at the beginning that see will see it through this kind of this sort of recalibration of sales cycles, whilst it might not be <clears throat> enjoying a great time at the moment its competitors are going to be even worse mm -hmm. and ultimately there's always demand for the sort of work it delivers um, so it's aiming to double the business again by 2028 um, i have every confidence that luke Bacquet and his team will will deliver on that and it's got the it's got the financial strength and the and yeah. the people to to do that i think it's there's reports on a weekly basis of consultants letting people go, Ernst & Young, Deloitte, PwC, accountants, McKinsey, getting rid of back office people. You know, I think that there's great, great potential here for, you know, a three-year view. Alpha will outperform. Mm. Who does it compete against? Is it is it against the traditional sort of like consultants who have this sort of financial services discipline? Is, is it that? Yeah, or is, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Well, and then the final one we've got is a um, energy transition investor, stroke fund manager, is um, is Foresight Group we, or Focus Solutions now, I think it's called. Um, and um, it seems to be doing. It's one of the few fund managers actually which has done well. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of money going into energy transition. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. This one has got recurring revenues around eighty-five to ninety percent of the total. So, <clears throat> very very strong. A very strong business model. Bernard Fairman doing a um, simply superb job in terms of you know, developing one the, the quality of the retail distribution platform that continues to deliver for the group. It's got a very robust institutional fundraising pipeline with uh, very good demand for the second vintage of its flagship energy transition strategy. Um, you, you've got it. The recent results it delivered EBITDA growth of twenty percent versus FY twenty three, and mm. large thanks in large to fundraisings into higher margin and long tenure investment vehicles. You've got annualization of acquisition activity and um, maintenance of of cost discipline. So this is a business I just think will continue to uh, power ahead. Yeah, well, you're right. I mean, it's got a five, nearly five percent dividend yield and trades on twelve and a half times PE. So, wrong. Uh, yeah, it does, it does <laughs> Another look, one that's wrong. <laughs> yeah, it does look pretty cheap. Okay, great. Well, thanks again, um, Ian. Um, anybody wants to ask any final questions, please just uh, just let me know. Um, but just before we finish, um, what's your sort of like the outlook just overall for equities for the rest of the year? Obviously, you've had a pretty good year, haven't you? Yeah, I think the I think the excitement that we had saw in in January, February about there being six interest rate cuts. Mm. Um, over the court in the US, that was always always seemed a bit sort of frothy to me. I think yeah. we're far more uh, sensible and prosaic outlook in terms of one, maybe two interest rate cuts in the final quarter of the year. I think, therefore, that the the sort of approach or the sort of feel certainly in UK UK equity market will be that you need solid good companies with 
no brackets around the important numbers doing yeah. good things. I think the the frustrate not the frustrating thing. I think it's a it's a stock picker's delight at the moment. The market um, because of the you know, some of the companies hopefully have convinced you today that you know, you've got some simply superb mm. operationally robust companies doing a wonderful job here and overseas. And the market just isn't putting value on them. So um, ultimately, that will change. And you, you can make a lot of money from these and other ideas in the market. Yeah. Um, but they do need to be proper companies. Those The interest rate environment is going to stay pretty much the same. So you need to look at sensible companies. The days of looking at exciting biotech and watching it quadruple, um, those days are uh, in the past, I think. Yeah, just on that theme of sensible companies, we've got a last question from uh, George Rose. He asks us about um, body coat, which I think is a specialist coating and sort of like, uh, you know, business for for automotive, I know, and for industrials and stuff like this. Yeah. And I think it trades at about sort of uh, 13 times PE, pays about 3.5% dividend yield. I guess it's, it's in that industrial sector. I don't know if you've ever had a look at this one at all. Yes, yeah, know it um, know it very well. Based in um, based in Macclesfield, got mm. got many many hundreds of site, uh, you know, several hundred sites around the world to do to do coatings for aerospace. I think this is a business that will go continue to to do very well. the The CEO, I think, is just about to retire or has mm. retired, but over the past ten years, it's another uh, wonderful self help story. Um, body coat used to be sort of a prior to the used to be sort of a, a cost plus and its nickname was um was body bag um, <laughs> any 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 sort of any sort of industrial downturn I've never heard that one before you never heard that one before no, yeah no. yeah i mean it, oh there's been a profit warning from body coat yeah all right yeah, okay. um, oh really what a surprise you yeah, know we've okay. seen a downturn in pmi by two points of course yeah. there's been a profit warning from body coat but no, they um, they they realised that the the value added they provided to um, customers was actually far more than that what they were charging for, and they 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 figured out um, a way of you know, sort of asking the customer how much they insured the part for, and it was far more than they were charged the work they were charging. So Bodycoat put its prices up, and then basically went through a huge um, sort of. A, again, a rationalization program in terms of understanding the customers, in terms of understanding how the plants would be run, make sure that they put their plants close to their customers, changed how they ran their plants. Funnily enough, um, body bag no longer. And it's a very strong, well-run company now. It has been for quite some time. And very, and perhaps most importantly, it's the rate of um, innovation. If they can't figure out how to sort of do a new coating, or a, a new product they're very very sort of smart about buying a sort of a, a 20 person company in the middle of the uk or the middle of tennessee that does some wonderful engineering i say right okay we'll we'll get you guys and um, that's going to be our new our new offering in sorry 12 18 months time whilst we do the bread and butter stuff um so the fact that they're very good at innovating and buying new clever stuff on addition good old cost maintenance and operational excellence right. i like body coat good okay well it sounds like it does fit the bill for being a sensible well-priced uh business so thanks uh, uh george for the question and uh big thanks to you ian for your time fascinating insights as always and uh look forward in uh in touching base in a couple of months time again lovely thank you very much